Hi everyone, you're listening to The Magic Hour. Today we're talking about food, herbs, and taking charge of your health with joyful Ebony Williams. She's a thyroid disease coach, certified personal trainer, food educator, and creates the most divine bath and body products. Ebony is here with us to share her knowledge on keeping your body in balance through skincare, a healthy diet, and living with joy. Let's make some magic. Hey everybody, Shireen here, and welcome to The Magic Hour. If this is your first time listening, then thank you for coming. The Magic Hour drops every Sunday for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at mylittlemagicshop.com, our official sponsor. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed, Spotify, or iTunes. You can also follow me on Instagram, at mylittlemagicshop, and Facebook. All links will be in the show notes. Now let's get to the show. Our guest today is certified personal trainer, food educator, and thyroid disease coach, Ebony. Welcome, Ebony. I'm so, so excited to have you as a guest. Thank you so much, Shereen. I'm so happy to be here. I cannot wait for our time together. Yes. Yay. Okay. So I do know a little bit about you because you you did come and we partnered together to create these beautiful products uh, for our little Zen box, which I'm like super excited about the soaps and the oils and I still use them. We heard rave reviews. So I think that through this collaboration, it led me to just learn a little bit more about you and, you know, your story. So I read that your journey to a healthier mind, body and soul really started with a chronic illness. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I have Hashimoto's disease. It's an autoimmune disease that affects your thyroid gland. And I would say that it kind of all started when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. So I experienced a lot of issues when I was about 16 or 17. But the problem, as you can imagine, was that was around puberty. So everyone was like, oh, it's okay. She's just being a hormonal teenager. It's all good. But what I think a lot of people missed is I am the most even tempered and calm person ever. So for me, it started to initially manifest itself in just anxiety. And all of a sudden I started failing my tests in school and I couldn't remember things. And I was just really anxious. And there were times where I was really, really angry Mm -hmm. and it was the weirdest thing. And just a little bit more context. um, I definitely come from a single parent household. My dad died when I was 13 and my mom did not take that well, even though they weren't necessarily together at the time that he passed away. But it was just very difficult. And just having to really support myself emotionally from the time I was very young until my adult life now, I can understand and see how now why stress triggered my autoimmune disease. And nothing against my mother. She's a wonderful person and she did the best that she could do. But I think that Knowing what I know now, I see how all of that kind of played together to really bring out the autoimmune condition that I have. And throughout my time in college, it just got worse and worse and worse. And I would go to the ER. I worked in a health center as a medical assistant. So I was constantly just asking the nurses, hey, can you take my temperature? Because I would sweat a lot. And I was actually in Minnesota when I found out about my condition. I remember I would be in lab because I was doing a lot of research and I was working in a biochemistry lab. And I remember holding the pipette in my hand and I would get really bad vertigo or dizziness. And this was my plan. It was always put the specimen on ice, dump the pipette in the ice because it was glass. Like I used to have this rubber mat at my bench. So if I fell, at least I would fall on the rubber mat and I wouldn't fall on the the concrete ground. I had this plan worked out. And of course, it never worked out that smoothly. It was always messy. It was gross. My doctors thought I had kidney stones that I never had. It's very hard to pass an imaginary kidney stone, by the way, a little hard. Or my hair would fall out. Like I could literally run my fingers through my hair and I would get a clump of hair. Wow. Not remembering how I got from point A to point B or having light sensitivity and joint pain and gaining a lot of weight and then all of a sudden losing it. And 
I'll never forget when the doctor came in and he was like, yep, Hashimoto's, that's what you got. And he walked out. I was like, bro, where you going? Wow. Wow. Went out in the hallway and I was like, excuse me, my insurance is paying you for this visit. You will come back in here or send someone else in here to explain this to me. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Hashi who? What you want me to do with this? And it, in retrospect, did I handle that the best? No. But after all of that time of just feeling like you were crazy because, you know, you would have people say, oh, you're distressed out. Maybe you can't handle being in a biochemistry program. And at the time, actually, I started off in college as a neuroscience and behavior major. Wow. And then I kind of got a little bored. So I was like, hmm, let me combine neuroscience and exercise physiology or kinesiology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and put them together. And here you go, exercise physiology. So no one ever saw me in college. I don't recommend doing that. That was not a good idea. (laughs) But yeah, it, it felt so good to have an answer. But at the same time, I was so frustrated because there was a point where I had a nurse say, Ebony, you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain. And that's why you keep having these temporary lapses of memory or not remembering how you got somewhere or, you know, that those, those fainting spells. So I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I guess first I want to say, wow, like sending your younger self a big giant hug, like that's, you know, losing a parent at a young age and then you're going through puberty after experiencing that and having this, it seemed very difficult to diagnose chronic illness, you know, that you don't understand and being dismissed by so many people. And then, of course, clearly you're brilliant. So taking on, you know, this, these very ambitious, um, pro like college programs. And I just like, I'm like, oh my God. And you, you hear, you, you made it through it with a big little <laughs> smile on your face and, you know, armed with all of these wonderful tools that we'll talk about a little bit later to help other people. So I just want to stop and be like, wow, like that's this is so inspirational and I'm just super inspired by that. So for those of my listeners who don't fully understand, can you tell us a little bit more about, how do you say it? Hoshimoto's, Hashimoto's disease. Hashimoto's disease. Yes. So it was named obviously after the person that discovered kind of the whole pathway of the disease, but it really involves our thyroid gland. So it is a butterfly shaped organ that sits at the base of your neck, which ironically, my thyroid gland sits lower than most people's. It's a little difficult uh, figuring that out for me too, because one of the things that your doctor will often do when you're in your appointment is, you know, they fill on your neck. And a lot of times you think they're just looking to find like your lymph nodes, or you're really just trying to figure out why you're touching my neck. That's weird. But they're not only checking your lymph nodes, but they're also checking your thyroid gland. They just don't articulate that they're doing that. But one of the things that I learned early on is that I had a goiter which is basically an enlargement of your thyroid gland. So your neck kind of sticks out. And when you think about it, you know how you have a a man has an Adam's apple. Mm -hmm. It can present itself like that, or the inflammation can literally spread downward or upward. And you just kind of have like a little lump sitting. Like even now my thyroid's a little inflamed mostly because I'm getting a lot of manipulation done because I'm seeing a chiropractor. So I know that I have a lot of inflammation going on, which is why I'll be drinking a lot of water today. But your thyroid gland is your body's thermostat. So your brain works to send signals to your thyroid gland and basically your endocrine system. So it's your kidneys. It is your liver, it's your reproductive organs, your thyroid gland, your hypothalamus, like all of those things work together to keep your body functioning smoothly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize how much your thyroid gland controls until it doesn't work. And I was definitely in that same camp. So thinking about controlling your breathing Mm -hmm. or your digestion, your joints. If you get really dry skin, you can have issues with your thyroid gland. Your hair can be brittle, just as your nails and your toenails. And all those things are 
pretty much affected by that little tiny organ in your neck. That people don't talk about very little. Like I have one friend who's like ever brought it up and like apparently it is like probably a pretty common, not specifically what you have, but it's a com- like imbalances within the thyroid are probably very, very common. Yeah. And it also affects men as well, but no one ever talks about thyroid imbalances in men because when you think about hormones, immediately you jump to thinking, oh, that's just a women thing. Oh, that just happens with menopause. But no, when I talk to a lot of people, I literally had like a 16 year old boy message me on Instagram, maybe two months ago. And he's like, I just found out I had it. Will I still be able to compete? Will I still be able to do all those things? Like, how am I going to die? Like, those are valid questions. I asked all of them when I was his age. Yeah. So it, it, it definitely can affect either sex. It's not just a woman thing or an older woman thing. Yeah. Wow. So, so I feel like I just learned so much. Okay. <laughs> so I guess I really would love to understand or to have you share like, so now you've, you've just finally figured out what is, what it is. And you're like, okay, so now that I have a little bit more research and clearly the doctor was not that helpful. So like shame on him and all the other doctors that do not take the time to explain things to people and they give them diagnosis that freak, like could be freaked out and they're cold, but like a whole another story. Mm-hmm. Um, so like now, so then what do you do next? You, you research some more and then what happens? So here's like a very quick and dirty rundown in terms of how I got from there to here. When you get a diagnosis, let's say, let's start there. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, I don't know what this is. Naturally, what do we do? We go online. <laughs> and <laughs> then you start looking up all those things. You stay up all night. And then by the time the morning comes, you're like, I don't know what I just looked at. Cause it's like 50,000 things that I just researched. 49,000 of them are conflicting. What am I supposed to do? That was where I was for a long time. And I was like, you know what? I ain't got time for this. Again, my background is research. So I went to the papers and I started reading about it and understanding like, okay, what are like the chemical and biochemical pathways associated with this? All right. Then I would take those same papers to my doctor's office. And first of all, they'd be like, girl, who is you looking at all of this stuff? Like (laughs) trying to get past that was interesting. And it's very hard to look at a research paper first off and be like, girl, I'm not reading all that. What you, what you want me to do with this? Mm-hmm. So what I always recommend is go to a research focused institution. Like my first thought is like a Harvard health or look up an integrative health branch or area of a hospital, mm-hmm. for example, start there. Because they're going to have what are called patient education pamphlets, and they give you an overview of diabetes, of hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, or different conditions that are easy to digest and understand, and start with those. Do not look at Dr. Google. Do not spend too much time looking at the images because I'm telling you right now, they will freak you out. You will think that you are sterile, that you will never get better, and you will be doomed for the rest of your life. I did that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Stay away from Google, guys. <laughs> yeah, like if, if you are going to research something, write everything down. And As it relates to who you are and your individual needs, think about that. So that's what I tell all my clients to do. I want you to write down your questions, think through, okay, here's what I got going on here. Mm -hmm. Here's what it's saying online. When I go to the doctor, here are, let's say, five questions that I have. Or if you're having symptoms, write down those symptoms. You may think, oh, well, you know, it was just one day. One day? can completely change the trajectory of your life. Like if I don't want to compare it to like getting into a bad car accident, but it's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And far too often, especially as women, especially as givers, Mm -hmm. you're just like, oh, okay, you know, I, you know, I just had a little headache or I'm really forgetful right now. It's just the season that I'm in. Do not ignore those things. Mm -hmm. So write that down. And then when you go to the doctor, present that to them and say, right at the beginning of your appointment, I have five questions that we need to get to before I leave today. 
Mm-hmm. I just want you to be aware of them. I'm going to ask them and they can either start your appointment with that or you can say, these are my questions. Can we discuss them throughout the visit? Mm-hmm. Now you can have between 15 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, depending on the type of doctor that you see mm-hmm. and their bedside or website manner given the state that we're in. Mm -hmm. So I always recommend that you come prepared and and have another sheet of paper to be able to write those things down. If it's something that the doctor says to you and you don't really understand, don't be afraid to interject and say, wait a minute, mm -mm, nope, Mm -hmm. I didn't get that. Go back. Mm -hmm. Layman's term, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So A lot of people look at that as being combative or you're challenging the doctor, but you're not. You're really trying to go from the the doctor being on a pedestal and you being below them to leveling that playing field because you're really the client of the doctor and it's also a partnership. So you should never feel like you're less than in that relationship because What you also have to think about is I drive your business. It's just like any other business or anything in the world. Customer service is always number one. And I talk about this in great detail about how to find an endocrinologist on my podcast, the Thyroid Warrior podcast. Mm -hmm. And I, I talk in depth about all of the things to look for. Once you're done, you may have to get blood work done and you may have to come in over and over again. There are some folks like I had to get an ultrasound because we wanted to rule out thyroid cancer. So there are different things that you have to do when you're thinking through having thyroid cancer versus hyperthyroidism versus hypo. Mm -hmm. And hyper is when your thyroid gland is overactive and hypo is when it's underactive. Mm -hmm. And Graves' disease is the autoimmune disease that turns your thyroid into becoming overactive, whereas Hashimoto's, which is what I have, makes it underactive. Interesting. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. So you can have, and like for me, I teeter between hyper and hypo symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's how, honestly, I started off, like I started off being really hyper. So my thyroid gland was just burning it poor little self out. And then all of a sudden it flipped and the doctors only were able to tell me, oh, you had a virus that pushed you over into being hypo and and really brought out your Hashimoto's. And I'm like, I don't know how that happens, but okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you you can't tell me anything else besides that? Nope. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. It, It sounds like a lot of what you're saying is like this idea of basically taking back your power, right? So like really, you know, being in partnership with whoever your healthcare provider is or your doctor and like making it more of a partnership and and educating yourself so that you can work in tandem with them and you can like not challenge them but ensure that you know they are paying specific attention to you that you know like you're almost like you're advocating for yourself and I think that that's something really beautiful because that's not something that most people you know openly talk about. You know, they don't openly talk about going into the doctor's office and advocating and doing their own research. They kind of, it's more like, a, you know, I'm going to put my my entire life in this person's hands, not and like kind of almost forgetting that they're just a person, you right. know, with, you know, a specific skill set. But, you know, the more that you, you were able to contribute to that and like kind of play your part really, you know, makes a huge difference. And then of course, like you take it a step further, because now you've armed yourself, you've partnered with them. And then you start to, I'm guessing, make changes in your life and, you know, and start to just tell me a little bit about those changes. Yeah. Uh, So what I think is so cool out of all of this is I actually just found a new endocrinologist last year. Mm -hmm. And he's funny because I talk to him, like I I keep a food journal Mm -hmm. and before I also had irritable bowel syndrome. So part of when you have one autoimmune disease, Mm -hmm. it can make you more susceptible to having others. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's called genetic clustering. So many of those same genes can express certain conditions that are very similar. So 
that's why it's so important to pay attention to those symptoms. So important to pay attention to things that run in your family. Mm -hmm. But for me, I ended up being vegetarian for almost a year. I would say like nine months or so Mm -hmm. because I could not eat anything. And the thought of eating meat physically made me sick for that period. That's all I did was just like try to eat plants and try to build up my gut health. And I ended up reading this book called The Gaps Diet. I'll get you the the name of it specifically that my mom introduced me to. Mm -hmm. And it's literally taking the approach of going all the way back. So I drank nothing but bone broth for about a week to two weeks. And then I, I started taking very high quality vitamins. I was working with my doctor to do this. I wasn't doing anything on my own. Mm-hmm. And then I slowly introduced um, vegetables and like carrots and potatoes and just a couple of peppers, not so much garlic, because I realized that was a little triggering at first. And, and that's also another way to rule out like what food sensitivities you have, like you can do this in partnership with your doctor, you can have them order a food allergy test with you and you they can do like the different pricks or blood tests or whatever, Mm -hmm. which is how I ended up abstaining from gluten for a while, Mm -hmm. because my body was just so inflamed Mm -hmm. that I I, I just, I just couldn't do it. So slowly I started adding more things. And when I did try animal protein again, I started with fish and then poultry and then beef, but all of those things, I would go to the farmer's market to get, I developed a partnership and a relationship with local butchers or farmers so that I knew where my food was coming from, what practices that they participate in, how were they feeding the animals, were they being responsible in how they prepared everything. So for me, that was really important. And I realized how much I started to feel better. But of course, sometimes you fall into old habits. And I went back to, or I not went back, but I got a job. I was working in New York at a hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's when the IBS symptoms started to present themselves because I was so stressed out. Mm -hmm. And I was working 12 to 15 hour shifts. And going home late, but then I wasn't really, uh, I would say centered or balanced from a home perspective because I was staying with my friend and her family. Then I moved to a room in the Bronx until I found my apartment that I ultimately settled in before moving to Parkchester. And it was just, whew, a lot. <laughs> I stress a lot and it's so yeah. it's like important that you brought this up because it's like you know like you can get into this place of like you know like flow right and then all of a sudden something new gets introduced in your life and like sometimes that new thing takes a little bit of adjustment and then you kind of start to you know get out of that flow and then of course it'll throw your whole body off so like then try so how did you get back into flow yeah my stomach <laughs> It was like, no, sis, like, I know you're enjoying New York. I know that you're enjoying eating all of this wonderful, amazing food, but it is not agreeing with you. Stop. Um, But I developed really bad acid reflux. Mm. And again, I was just constantly nauseous. And I said, okay, here we go with this again. And shortly, like the diarrhea and constipation started. And I said, okay, okay, I'm going to the doctor. Fine. Okay, body, I get it. So I ended up seeing a gastroenterologist because around the time there was also a really nasty bug floating around. Actually, it was H. pylori and my coworker had it. And I remember looking at her like, I'm going to need you to like exit say, can you go home? Like, do you have to be here? Yeah, you have to. Um, And then I also saw my mom and she has C. diff. And that's also something that is running rampant in society. But I'll leave that for another conversation another day. But I ended up talking to my GI doc and I was like, listen, I'm not taking Prevacid or any other, you know, crazy acid reducer for my stomach. I, I already know that I have issues of high acid. I know that. Like I literally have to sleep like in the V shape with my head propped up on a pillow and my feet propped up. Wow. So those are those were not my choices. I was that uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate her so much because she could literally like you could see how like my stomach like I looked like I was like 
three months pregnant. Mm -hmm. Like that's how distended my abdomen was. And she would just press it ever so gently. And I just like, I'm flinching, just remembering it and how much pain I was in. But again, you don't realize how bad something is until you get to a point where you can't take it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to be on medication, but I'm like, I refuse. I'm just, I'm not doing it. Like I I am on medication for my thyroid condition. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, that's the only medication I want to take. Like, that's it. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know what, Ebony, you are actually one of my patients that I can tell, you know, what's going on. And you know your body because I I ran through like, here's what I eat in a day. This is what I do. This is what I know I shouldn't do. This is what I need to do more of. Here's how many hours of sleep I get because your body regenerates when you sleep. I wasn't getting a lot of sleep. Mm-hmm. And we ended up doing peppermint oil and digestive bitters. That is what sparked my curiosity and interest into looking into herbs and how to heal my body from that perspective. Mm-hmm. And it also introduced me to essential oils at the time. Mm -hmm. So I just, it's so funny thinking about the different doctors that I interact with throughout my time because they got me here. Yeah. well, I mean, one doctor, I, I'm not going to lie. My parents went with me to that visit and I was bawling hysterically. He was like, what are you crying for? Like, I mean, it is what it is. You have what you have. There's nothing else you could do about it. And I may have called him some words too. <laughs> I don't do well with those kind of doctors. No, <laughs> it's not good, but I do. Both spectrums, though, right? Because it's like the ones that were bad. They also empowered you to take your pow- take your ownership, and take your power back, and like do the additional research because you didn't trust them, right? And then the ones that were great that introduced you to like alternative thinking, like that. You know, that also just like widened your breadth of you know knowledge and access. So I really, I really love that, and it's so funny because you. Uh, Uh, brought up bitters and it's like when I my mom's Jamaican so I think back to like when I was little like or just that I lived in Jamaica for two years and when I was little like all this stuff like we had to drink you had to drink this tea called Circe tea and so like I keep it in my like medicine cabinet of herbs I have a herbal medicine cabinet and Circe tea was like this tea and it's terrible oh it's disgusting I've had it (laughs) disgusting but it's like, fantastic for cleansing your body like they're just like so like you that was what you we, we call it bush so like you went and you got some bush you go to the bush lady she would you know tell you and that was how you you know you you healed yourself but like then you know you in America I feel like it's just so different it's like take this pill then take this pill then you have people that are like taking 20 30 pills per day and like then you have to worry about is this interacting with that and it just you know really (laughs) really, yeah really really fascinating so I love that you that all right so tell me more about moving you know this way of of herbs so you you started with the peppermint and the and the bitters and then you got really excited. So then what happened next? Yeah, that is when New York literally became my oyster because I took it for granted now that I don't live there anymore. And I'm just going to say, if you are in the New York area, consider yourself very blessed or in an area where you can get to an herbalist. Like I actually drove there to go to the radical herb shop. Like the herbalist there is amazing. And we, I think I spent like almost two, two and a half hours in his shop. And he was like, uh, are you an herbalist? Like, you know a lot about, I was like, oh no, I just, I just loved him. It's been about 10 years now. And he was like, wait, what? (laughs) Um, but I, I would go to like Union Square and go to the farmer's market and I would try to find as many fresh herbs as possible. Like I was drying herbs. I had a little line up in my apartment Mm -hmm. and I would hang them upside down. Mm -hmm. And it was just so amazing to learn about like peppermint and understand like for me peppermint and spearmint and ginger were like my trio I would just make a tea with those three things all the time and then I learned about fresh turmeric and then I started adding that 
And then I really and truly started to look at other herbs and like learning about St. John's wort and even how that's really good for your skin. But you also have to be careful if you're taking blood pressure medication because it can be a contraindication for that. But if I use the oil of this, if I have pain from my joints, Mm -hmm. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Cool. (laughs) And just, I think too, what also made this so great for me was that I, I had doctors that even when they didn't necessarily agree, or they probably thought I was crazy, but they knew that I just had that personality type that Mm -hmm honestly, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. And you can either support me in it Mm -hmm. or I'm going to go find another doctor that will. That's pretty much how that went. Yeah. Um, So I always kept them in the loop. And then like I learned about the um, Arnica and how it's amazing for just healing and it helps to reduce. Like I literally have, I just made some herbal infused oils with rose, calendula, and arnica. And like calendula is such a great wound healing oil. And even like if you ever have like razor bumps or something like that, and you use a calendula oil, dry that up real quick. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So learning how to use herbs to really support my immune system and to support my body and to understand, I think, how they can work in harmony with like conventional medicine, Mm -hmm. which I'm definitely a fan of, but having that partnership and, and that just natural curiosity and all those things really led me to just using them as a daily practice. And I mean, I, I have an herb basket in my cabinet. I have two large baskets actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of my clients came over last night and I made her a woman's neutral tea Mm -hmm. for, um, her uh, stomach cramps and all that stuff. And all of that love and passion just led me to becoming a certified holistic nutritionist, Mm -hmm. depending on the state. Mm -hmm. I have to say nutrition professional, Mm -hmm. totally get it. Nobody come after me. I Mm -hmm. I stay in my scope of practice, promise. (laughs) Um, But you know, it's just learning more about the holistic aspect of health and just just digging deeper and deeper. It's, it's really been an amazing journey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like in my ideal world, it would be, you know, your traditional MD, your shaman, and then your like really holistic person. And they would all work in tandem with each other. Like one would be like, okay, let's figure out the emotional stuff. Do we need to go yes. through the soul? And then the other one will be like, okay, here's like the biology behind them. And then the other one's like, okay, like let's do some energy work. And then we're also going to have you drink this tea and I feel like that would be like yes. the ideal situation but I kind of feel like as a society we we are getting closer and closer to that and I think it's because people like yourself are demanding that they're demanding mm-hmm. that doctors you know like you can't be like a, a regular MD anymore you know people are oh. going to come in and they're going to be like listen so like I go to acupuncture like I work with a herbologist like you know I work with a shaman I like you know I meditate like they're they're bringing in all these alternative things that you do as a doctor have to take into consideration because if your patient is working with an herbologist like that might interact with their medicine so it's important to understand like I don't I feel like like regular MDs like y'all are are a dying breed yeah (laughs) I'm like we're gonna need y'all to step up (laughs) a little bit and it's so great because I get to just kind of play a little tiny piece Mm -hmm. in in challenging that because of what I do in my nine to five work and just speaking up about those things and just talking about what I do and how I support my health and people can see it. Like I I had someone the other day ask me like, Oh my God, what do you do to your skin? What? What? Like, Oh, carrot seed and frankincense with a little bit of lavender. It's totally (laughs) fine. (laughs) And they're just like, really? I can't get that Dwayne Reed. (laughs) Right. Just throw it in a little bit of carrier Earl girl. You'll be fine. It's fine. It's fine. (laughs) Love that. I guess um, another question I have for you is what made you want to move from self-focus to sharing with others? I know you talked a little bit about, you know, like your clients. So you went from this huge transformational moment, kind of really take the, take, took the reins 
you know, to your health and started to see these improvements in yourself and like your skin is glowing and like, you know, like your health is under control. And then now you're like, okay, I want to share with other people. Yeah, I, it actually started with my mother. She is of the generation that was always like the doctors know what that, Mm -hmm. and you know, that, that those were not my choices. (laughs) And seeing her with a host of medical problems, I'm like, mommy, no. (laughs) And she actually was seeing um, a DO and I love him. What's a DO? So osteopathic medicine. Okay. Um, And let me just double check my reference to make sure because I don't want anyone saying, girl, that ain't right. (laughs) People will call you out. (laughs) They sure will. They sure will. Yes, it is. Okay, great. So Mm -hmm. osteopathic medicine. My my friend would be like, girl, you don't know that. Listen. <laughs> um, yes, osteopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get her to take a fish oil supplement Mm -hmm. and also to kind of ease her anxiety with using, it was an herbal pill that, but it also had like lavender essential oil in it. It was an organic product. Mm -hmm. And what cracked me up was she was like, this doesn't work. I'm like, wait a minute, how long did you take it? She's like two days, but it didn't work. I'm like, (laughs) ma'am, 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 you have to give something at least 30 to 60 days to work. She's like, I don't have that long. And that's why you're still in this predicament. But the the other problem was obviously the supplements cost more. Yeah. And she's but on a fixed income. income. No, they don't. Mm-hmm. Nope, they don't. No. Nope. I just want to say, like, there are some drugs out there that mm-hmm. are ridiculous. They are. And I'm like, I'm most, a lot of these things, like, once you learn what's in them, you're like, hmm, lavender is not that expensive. <laughs> no, it is not. Uh, I, I often have a lot of people tell me, well, eating organic food costs so much money. And I said, well, hold on, wait a minute, mm-hmm. because I am also the budget queen and I will find a coupon for everything. <laughs> And I was like, let me help you out a little bit. So Mm -hmm. I literally took a week and I did a cost analysis because again, research numbers, analytics, that's all me. So I would tell my friends that like when they're like, oh, it's too expensive. I was like, "Mm -mm." pulled out my handy dandy chart. I, yes, I carried it with me. And I also had a copy on my phone and I said, this is one week for me. Like I literally would spend no more than $54 for the week shopping at an organic grocery store. Wow. That's that. Let's just talk about this for a little bit. Mm -hmm. That is quite impressive, especially Mm -hmm. if you're talking about in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So and then I'm both Ben is your friend. But I'm, I'm also guessing you probably bought a lot of fresh product or like fresh yeah. produce, like a lot of, because I imagine if you're buying mostly like fruits and vegetables that are fresh and you're like a pretty decent cook, then I can totally see. And I think that in America, we do have a lot of, you know, we, we want everything fast and convenient yeah. and like, and simple. And like, I know that like, especially if you live in a neighborhood that's, you know, like a, lo- a little bit hood or like, you know, like a neighborhood that's not, um you know, not, not, I, I don't want to say the wrong word. Here, but I'll I, say it for you. I'll say it for you. Where I live was the hood. Okay. Let me, let me go ahead. So I used to have my car on the, the two train. I would go all the way down have my little cart, have my vegetable scooting onto the subway. Like, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you don't always have those things in your neighborhood. But I love like the Spanish markets and going to the Caribbean markets and they have a plethora of yes yes but definitely like I think a little different though because there's certain like there's er, like I love sorrel so like again I'm Mm. drinking so like I love and then I found out later that sorrel is like a hibiscus plant and it Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like really great for uh, like this whole thing whole tons of things that I had no idea I just thought it tasted good but I think that you find like lots of things like that that you know are are very common to wherever you're from if you're shopping in a Caribbean or like Spanish store or whatever but what I do notice is that you know I, I live in East Harlem and so in East Harlem like you know you go to the grocery store and the produce section is not very large a lot of oh, times like yeah now it's 
it's getting a little bit better. The neighborhood, you know, I think they're investing a little bit more in grocery stores, but I do find that like there's not as much like organic produce and like sometimes, you know, it does feel like it feels a little bit more expensive for some reason there than if you went to like Whole Foods or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I so I just wanted to kind of like point that out because I do think that um, when you think of grocery shopping, it actually is much more affordable to shop the way that you're saying with this $54 focusing on your fruits and your vegetables and your actual like whole foods and then taking it home and cooking. The problem is that most Americans are going for the frozen stuff, yes. you know, and the processed stuff and the things that are easy and simple. But now, and, and again, you alluded to this earlier, is that we are, as consumers, are driving companies towards more organic frozen foods. And they're they're pushing to reduce the sodium content in those things. They're reducing um, a lot of like the, the trans fats and all the things that aren't good for us. And that from the, the consumer, that's from you and me. And, and what I often tell my mom too, is like, you can go and get your frozen vegetables. She's like, girl, I'm not chopping up all that. Cool. No problem. Get you some chopped spinach at the store. Okay. And and those those were things like even when I, I first started, like I'll never forget when I was little, I asked my mom to make me carrot because like growing up black, like, you know, collard greens, fried chicken, cornbread, black, you know, black eyed peas, all that stuff is like, good. Mm-hmm. But over time, not so much. And I remember I, I was sitting at my little table and she put them in front of me. Now, mind you, she had no idea how to cook them because that wasn't that wasn't our norm. Mm-hmm. And I just remember sitting there and I was so happy. And then I stuck my fork in it and I was like, why is it so mushy? But mm-hmm. when you get lemon, make lemonade, I put a little bit of brown sugar in it mm-hmm. and a little bit of butter. And I was like, okay, great, this works. Mm-hmm. But you know, as I got older learning, like I make mashed carrots and parsnips all the time and it makes me think of that. Mm-hmm. So it, it's trying to find ways to make healthier choices. And you don't like, I, I tell people all the time, like, yeah, I, I get it. Organic food is quote unquote the best. But if you're someone that doesn't eat fruits and vegetables normally, just mm-hmm. starting with adding another apple or if you don't like apples, add an orange or just something, yeah. just one thing a day, nothing yeah. crazy. Because little by little, those choices that you make every day add up to something big. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it is fantastic advice. I think because I like I personally, you know, like I feel like I just like go 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 it's so funny because I I have this uh, deck I made that are like messages from my guides and so every morning I pull a card and so today's card was slow down and it was from my my um I have a guide that's like a child and so she like says everything simply and I was like yeah no I've been feeling like that whereas I feel like you're going 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 and like I'm like I have these grand ideas of all the wonderful things I want to cook and then you know time rolls on and I'm like yeah I need something really fast but I do think that Mm -hmm. what you're saying absolutely just becoming more conscious and also just taking the time to make those little tweaks and over time you know those things will start to really really add up and definitely can make changes in your health so I love that you said that yeah and even like I I meal prep religiously even Mm -hmm. even though we're we're quarantined and we're at home I still cook like my days to cook are Saturday and Sundays Mm -hmm. and I batch prep all of my meals for the week and you know you can throw in your veggies on a roasting pan and there you go there are your your veggies for the week if you go to the grocery store and they have like that big five dollar bag of mixed vegetables put that in the oven throw some olive oil on it a little bit of sea salt bam you're good. Fabulous. If you are like, I don't want to use a lot of dishes, throw you some some chicken breast on there. Don't cook it too long because chicken breast dries out real fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, put your vegetables around that and you're good. They they have plenty of frozen vegetables. They have rice that's frozen now. You can get cauliflower rice, white rice, brown rice, like quinoa now. So it it, it, we're really, we're really on to something health wise. Oh, I love that meal prepping. I feel like I was always at my healthiest when I just like would take that Saturday or that Sunday and cook for four hours and just like freeze it all. And like, it just, just so much, so much easier. And I'm like, oh, I should start doing that again. So thank you for that reminder. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love this. <laughs> 
So um, I feel like I could talk with you forever and ever, but you know, I want to keep the episode, you know, a little, I want to, we'll bring you back. We'll talk yeah. about tons of other stuff. Um, but I do have a couple more questions. Yeah, let's get to it. So my first question, it's a feed your soul question. And this is just more about like how you care for yourself spiritually, emotionally, physically. And so we've talked a lot about physical, um, but I want to talk about the more like emotional um, and spiritual. So are there any consistent activities or rituals you do to maintain a sense of inner? So it's, it's, it's funny you asked me this question because I'm literally, I have like a mantra wall Mm. and like, I mean, I, I pray, I meditate, I stretch and I journal a lot because I need to keep myself grounded and centered. And I try very hard to do these things daily. Mm -hmm. And when I'm really like feeling magical comes to mind. Mm -hmm. So feeling magical comes to mind. And I really love to color and draw. And I actually just bought some small canvases and more paint because I haven't done it in years. Oh my word. I cannot wait. Oh, I to get my hands it. dirty. Yay. I love it. I love it. And it's so interesting that I mean like you're so like I feel like you're, you know, clearly you're very smart like in a more traditional sense, but then also like so incredibly creative because it's like, okay, so now I'm learning that you paint and draw, but then you also <laughs> make soaps and body oils and like all this stuff. So I think wow, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is do you have any favorite movies that always revive your spirit (laughs) I laugh because I have two movies one is The Lion King that is my all-time favorite movie ever Mm -hmm. and then uh, well three and then there is The Princess and the Frog because I identify with Tiana's hard-working spirit and just tenacity Mm -hmm. And then Moana, because she just kept pushing and fighting. And her and Tiana are very similar to me. But, you know, I think about her grandmother in the movie where she's like, I'm the village crazy lady. And a lot of times I feel like that because of like the herbs and the oils and all this like natural medicine that I'm into. And I just, I love Tafiti and just how you can really lose yourself when other things kind of pick at you. And there's a scene in the movie where uh, Moana is walking through and the, the sea kind of parts and she goes to replace her heart. And that just speaks to me because like I've gone through a divorce and learning how to get back to that heart center is just so incredibly valuable to me. So I just, those are my three movies. Oh, I love those. Those are beautiful. Okay, my third and final question is when it comes to self-development, what are the books or tools that really offered life-changing discoveries for you? Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. So I really wish I was sitting in front of my bookcase right now, but two that pop into my mind, the first one is The Energy Bus. Love that movie, the, or excuse me, that book, because it really taught me about like energy vampires. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I start, like a friend told me about that book when I had just, started going through the process of my divorce and it was just it was a game changer for me and then the second one one that I'm actually like listening to slash reading right now because I can't just have audiobooks I need both Mm -hmm. and that is strength-based leadership it's actually from the guy that developed the Gallup poll and I love that book because far too often all we hear like you think about the SWOT analysis like what are your opportunities for growth how can you get better but we don't we don't help people see their strengths and play to their strengths in order to really bring up the quote-unquote perceived weaknesses that they may have so I'm just like like blown away at those just they're very different because one speaks to just the very plain language version of things and then the other is very science-based so it kind of speaks to both sides of my brain I love it Mm -hmm. oh I love that I love that those are definitely great and I'm going to list them right um, in the show notes. Oh my gosh. So thank you so much. This was a wonderful chat and I can't wait to have you back on so you can tell me more things about treating the body well and about herbs. I feel like we could have multiple episodes just on this and so much valuable information, your wealth of knowledge. So can you tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you? 
Yeah, I am at Joyful Ebony on all social media platforms. And my website is joyfulebony.com. And one thing that I'm actually really excited to announce is I am launching Sula Beauty Co. Um, on November 11th. So that's going to be more of my handmade body product. I am- Wow, 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 wow. Sorry. Yeah. Say it. <laughs> I'm excited about that, but also the date though. So yeah. that's, like, it's like right after Mercury goes direct and bring out the astrology. So I'm just like, okay, I'm about it. I'm about it. <laughs> yeah. I And I didn't even process that until I was talking to someone and, and actually he's, He's one of my holistic nutrition buddies. And, you know, I, I like um, randomly sending people gifts. Mm-hmm. I'm learning that gifts are also a part of my love language in addition to quality time. Mm-hmm. So I told him I wanted to send him a box for my launch. And he's like, oh, when is it? And I said, November 11th. He was like, you mean 11 11? I was like, yes. And then, like, my <laughs> eyes were just like, oh, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations in advance. I know it's going to be amazing and I can't wait to drop that right in the links in the show. You know? yeah. Oh, thank you so much again. Yes. Okay, so thank you everyone for tuning into the Magic Hour. We hope you enjoyed listening. Be sure to check out the show notes over at mylittlemagicshop.com for more information on today's guest, Ebony Williams. We hope to see you again next Sunday. And as always, Sending you so much light, love, and magic. And remember, without a dream, you can't have a dream come true. So make sure you're making your own magic.